Okay. The Michigan Wetlands Association is excited to present Dr. Don Uzarski, Dr. Matt Cooper, and Todd Rutter. Dr. Don Uzarski is a professor of biology at Central Michigan University, where he is also the director of CMU's Institute for Great Lakes Research. He's also the director of CMU's biological station located on Beaver Island. Dr. Don Uzarski is a nationally and internationally recognized coastal wetland expert with over 100 peer reviewed publications being cited over 2,500 times. His research largely focuses on ecosystem health and Great Lakes coastal wetlands. And he leads the Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands Monitoring Program, uh, which to date, his team has sampled nearly 100% of Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands. Dr. Matt Cooper is a research assistant professor at CMU's Institute for Great Lakes Research and an instructor of life sciences at Muskegon Community College. Dr. Cooper has studied Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands for many years and has published 40 scientific articles and book chapters on the topic. Dr. Cooper is co-principal investigator for the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. Todd Rutter is a senior environmental and water resources engineer with Limnotech. Todd's expertise lies in the development and application of mathematical models and data analysis for tools for the evaluation of hydrodynamics, water quality, sediment transport, contaminant fate and transport, and ecosystem response in watersheds and lakes and rivers. Todd also designs custom databases and decision support tools. He serves as data manager and tool developer for the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program for which he also is on the leadership team. The Michigan Wetland Association welcomes these Great Lakes Coastal Wetland experts. Dr. Yuzarski and team, please take it away. All right, thank you for that. I'm gonna share my screen. And you let me know if that's coming up okay. Good. Yep, just kick on over into presentation mode. Oh, it should be. There, there it is, yep, oh, that's okay. good. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna start out and just give you an idea of what we're gonna talk about. Of course, we're gonna be talking about the Great Lakes uh, Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program. Uh, but the way we're gonna do it, we'll start out with the history and of where it came from, introduce the program itself, and then I'm gonna kick it over to Todd, who's gonna talk about the database and all of its bells and whistles. And then finally, Matt is going to talk about the decision support. So the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Monitoring Program really starts out with the Great Lakes Coastal Wetland Consortium. And that started out in 2000 when US EPA Great Lakes National Program Office put out an RFP for $1.2 million and there was a $600,000 supplement that went to that. And these were in response to the State of the Lakes Ecosystem Conferences, both in 1996 and 1998. If you're not familiar with those, those are conferences where US EPA gets together with Environment and Climate Change Canada to discuss Great Lakes issues. That effort, those efforts were calling for indicators of ecosystem condition at that time. And the RFP was specific to developing a binational standardized monitoring program based on these SOLAC indicators that we talked about up here. The only problem was that they really weren't developed. They, they hadn't been tested. They were basically just brainstorming ideas of what indicators could be for these ecosystems. So that takes us to 2000 when the, cons the consortium was formed. And the consortium was initially a joint facilitation between Great Lakes Commission and EPA, Great Lakes National Program Office. The Great Lakes Commission was mainly involved, so these, this effort could span borders, both US and Canada. Initially, it was made up of 150 participants representing 50 organizations from federal, state, provincial, academic, and NGOs. Immediately after the consortium formed, the consortium itself put out a request for proposals, and that was to develop and evaluate metrics and protocols for measuring ecosystem condition. The development process was very specific. 
It had to consider the cost of doing this work, measurability, baseline applicability, data availability, sensitivity to change, endpoint levels, and the whole thing had to be under a sound statistical umbrella. Six proposals were selected by the peer review process. And those six proposals were to conduct pilot studies and that would begin in 2002. These were the six that were selected. Um, my group, our group, got together with Joel Ingram and Steve Timberman's group who were working on Lakes Ontario and Erie. And Matt and I, of course, were working on, and also Tom Burton. We're working on Michigan, Huron, and Superior. So we got together to do this pilot study and we actually could conduct it on all five of the Great Lakes. We didn't submit, the consortium itself did not submit the final product to US EPA all the way until March of 2008. So at that time, much of these protocols were had already gone through peer review and publication process. And you can still find that a final report on our website that you'll hear a lot more about uh, later, but that is greatlakeswetlands.org. So that takes us to 2009 and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative where US EPA Great Lakes National Program Office put out an RFP for $10 million to monitor coastal wetlands using these protocols that we had developed up to that. We answered that call. Uh, many of the organizers or many of the, the people originally involved in developing the indicators, uh, if not all of them were on our effort. And we were awarded that $10 million in 2010 to conduct research through 2015. And in 2015, we renewed for another 10 million to, to do it from years six through 10. And currently we're in years 11 through 15. So essentially these are our sites and you're looking at the coastal wetland sites across the base in US and Canada. And here they're just color coded by the type of coastal wetland that, that each is. So we actually sample every coastal wetland in the basin that is at least four hectares in size with a surface water connection to the Great Lakes. So we had to draw the line somewhere um, on our sampling pool. So every five years, we're sampling over a thousand Great Lakes coastal wetlands. We're sampling chemical physical conditions, invertebrates, fish, plants, birds, amphibians, and we had a sister project that was providing adjacent land use land cover led by Laura Chavez. And again, all of these protocols uh, went through the peer review publication process that we're using. We can use each of those indicator groups to essentially quantify disturbance in these ecosystems and you can put those into bins. You could say it's extremely degraded to reference conditions. Reference conditions meaning this is the best that we can expect today under our current condition. Or you could report that as a percentage of that reference condition. Our group spans the basin. Of course, Central Michigan University is right here in the center of the Lower Peninsula. I am currently up here on Beaver Island at our biological station. But our partners include University of Minnesota Duluth, University of Wisconsin, that's Green Bay, River Falls, and Superior, Grand Valley State University, Notre Dame, Michigan Eagle, University of Windsor, Bird Studies Canada, SUNY Brockport, Environment Canada, Lake State, and also USGS, and of course, Todd's with Limno Tech. So our sampling design entails randomly selecting about 250 wetlands to sample per year. 
And then in order to get trends to be able to see if these are improving or which direction condition is going in, we resample 10% of our previous year's sites. And the reason why we don't continue, there are some sites that we actually go back to over and over and over and have since the 1990s. The problem with doing that at a lot of sites is that the sites where we do it, you can see our transects from Google Earth. So that means we are the, having an impact, a negative impact on that ecosystem. So by randomly selecting 10% sample, we can still get that trend data without having such great impact system itself. We stratify our sites by region and by lake. And again, keep in mind, we are sampling every component, every major component of the ecosystem. And each of these components has its own suite of metrics to, to calculate, mathematical models that we put together based on just chemistry or in physical measures and land use, or based on just invertebrates or based on just fish. And you have to be really careful how you look at these data because you have to understand that the indicators are indicating disturbances at different scale, not only different scale, but potentially different regions within the coastal wetland itself. So plants indicate disturbance at a very coarse scale, for example, and I'll show you an example. Invertebrates are a very local uh, scale. And then for example, fish are somewhere in between because they're, they're very mobile. It's an also extremely important to understand that individual wetlands do not experience disturbance uniformly. Different portions of the wetland are going to receive different types of disturbance. And this is all related and based on hydrology. Hydrology is everything. And think about this ecosystem as a gradient from truly terrestrial environment to truly aquatic. So it is that gradient. And therefore, it would only make sense that the ecosystem itself is going to dis experience disturbances in different locations from different directions. So a typical fringing coastal wetland right along the shoreline of one of the Great Lakes would have a forested swamp component, a shrub swamp, would transition into a wet meadow, and this is all controlled by hydrology. Right at the location where waves are dampened and the water is pretty stable, there's always water inundation. We tend to see a narrow band of cattails. And then bulrushes and then the aquatic bed, those organisms, those the vegetation that can withstand high wave energy. So very specific zonation in these systems and we incorporate that into how we sample the system themselves. So if you think about this higher elevation portion of the wetland, it's much more impacted from what is coming off the landscape. So any impacts coming off the landscape would have to be able to make it all the way through this coastal wetland out into this wave swept area. And if the impact does make it all that way, it could easily be diluted uh, from the pelagic zone. Uh, being advected in there, or there, there could be an impact coming from the pelagic zone or an adjacent river mouth, like the Saginaw River, for example. And that's what we see as Saginaw Bay. This is back when Saginaw Bay coastal wetlands looked very different. I'm standing in the photo to the left with my toes in the water, and I'm looking out at open water out here, and this is just this is about 400 meters of Xenoplectus. And then we go out to the other end and we're out here with a boat. You can see the waves swept. You could see the impacts would be diluted out here. And now we're looking all the way back to shore. But of course, Saginaw Bay wetlands look very different today. We have this wall of Phragmites and then often find a very small fringe of Xenoplectus. Um, on the waterward side of that. So you can just imagine this amount of biomass. We're looking at the top of a tree 
at the shoreline here. So an impact coming off the landscape would have to penetrate this basic wall of biota and make it through it. On the other hand, the Saginaw River in this case is delivering impacts to this lower elevation portion of the wetland. So we have to be very careful of how we look and use individual indicators. So this is an example right here. You're looking at water quality and land use land cover combined into something that we started calling some rank. And it's our disturbance gradient that we, one of our disturbance gradients that we train our other metrics based on. But you can look at, if we take this one site right here, depending on where you are in that wetland, you could have the outer portion in this case is telling us the water quality is reference conditions. While that's not true for inside of that outer fringe, it's saying that water quality is actually moderately impacted. So the, the system is not receiving impacts uniformly at all. And if we go through time with water level changes and, and changes that take place on the landscape or in the open water or in the atmosphere, through time, we see water quality changes. So this one site in 2012 was moderately degraded. By 2015, we're looking at mildly impacted just with respect to water quality. But then when we start incorporating other indicators into that, now we're looking at vegetation telling us the condition of the ecosystem. Now, with respect to vegetation, it's pretty apparent that where the populations are, we have more impacted coastal wetlands. But as we go north, it's pretty uniform that it gets greener. It gets higher quality with respect to the macrophytes. That's what I mean by a very coarse resolution. And then if we take fish, for example, now fish is somewhere in intermediate scale to where now we can see the fish are not only responding to water quality, but they're also responding to habitat quality. So we could have a mild, a very mildly impacted coastal wetland right next door to a very degraded ecosystem. But again, I, I warn you that you have to really understand what these indicators are indicating. So you can access our database, but there, and, and Todd will talk about this more. Uh, there are different levels of access to get to the database. Of course, US EPA and our researchers not only can hit the raw data, but we can manipulate it. We can enter our data, our new data into it and manipulate it from there. State and federal wetland managers can access, I say here, some of the raw data. I don't think we've ever not given all of the raw data that was requested. And certainly they can easily access without our help, the analyzed data as well. NGO is working on restoration and conservation, get full access to analyzed data. And on a case by case basis, we've given out the raw data as well. And then the general public, anyone, can access uh, these summarized data. So I just want to include again all of the groups. Uh, this couldn't, you know, we could not pull off anything of this magnitude without a lot of talented people from, from across the base and in different institutions. And also I want to thank uh, the US EPA, who is not only our sponsor, but also a true partner in this effort. Uh, working side by side. And now I'm going to hand it over to Todd. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hopefully he can share his. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Don. I should be sharing. Uh, hope that's coming through okay. Yes, it is. Good. Thanks, Don. Yeah, so I'm going to spend the next uh, 15 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes, building on the uh, program overview that Don provided and highlighting in particular the CWMP data portal uh, and some associated data management and analysis tools that we've built into that. Um, I'll, I'll mention I'm not going to spend the time going through database details, but there is a 
um, large and um, well-designed and customized database that sits behind uh, the web portal, uh, where all the data basically are um, from the, the uh, monitoring effort are, are pushed into and then um, leveraged for different uh, you know, data dissemination efforts and analysis efforts. So I won't go into detail on the database, but know that that's behind the scenes. Um, uh, so I, Don mentioned that there are a suite of data entry tools that the research team uses. I'm not going to spend time looking at those today. I'm going to focus more on the kind of the back end um, tools and options for viewing, um, retrieving some of the data, especially some of the disturbance gradient results that Don highlighted, um, as well as some other tools, just kind of piece things together and, and lightly analyze the data. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of a tour here. So this is the greatlakeswetlands.org uh, homepage. This would be the view you would see as an unregistered user just accessing the site. Um, available at the top here, you can go to the site mapping tool or decision support tool. I'm going to spend a few minutes on the site mapping tool uh, before I hand off to Matt Cooper, who's going to talk more about the decision support tool. So let's go ahead and go there. Um, so what this provides is an interactive um, web map environment here where you can view uh, the roughly 1,000 coastal wetland sites that Don described that have been monitored by the program since 2011. Um, so 11 years of data kind of reflected across these sites. Um, by default, we kind of look at these by geomorphic type. Um, you also have the option to look at um, sampling year. Um, you can also overlay, um, by default, you just... Uh, you can view the uh, site centroids, but you can also overlay the coastal wetland um, polygons, uh, kind of the footprint, um, which uh, many of those were established some years ago. Um, so, of course, with the water level changes, they are not necessarily true to current conditions. In many cases, they are not, um, but they do provide kind of a sense for the wetlands footprint. So useful, useful data nonetheless. Um, you have options to do things like toggle base map options on and off, um, navigate between specific sites. I'll highlight some of these things um, in a moment. Um, so that's kind of the basic view for uh, the tool. Again, if you're not a registered user, you can see all of these things. Um, the more interesting information is available once you're, you have a, a manager account like Don described or a more advanced account if you're associated with the research team um, under the program. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and log in and highlight some of these, these tools for you. Um, so again, I'm coming back to the site mapping tool. Very similar default view, but now we can take a look and see that we have additional options for uh, symbolizing the, the different wetland sites. And uh, I won't go through all these in, in detail because Don highlighted them already. Um, but uh, we have uh, views for, for example, um, the three different IBIs included um, the disturbance gradients that Don described, vegetation, invertebrates, and fish. Uh, here would be the view for vegetation. This is showing the very latest IBI results for vegetation. Um, we do have data back through multiple years for many of the sites due to monitoring being conducted now for 11 years and ongoing. Um, and I'll show you different ways to, that that can be looked at as well. Um, in addition to that, we have uh, indices of ecological condition for neurons or amphibians and birds, uh, as well as the water quality index, um, which is um, the sum rank that Don described a few minutes ago. So kind of all the options that he described are here if you have a level one or level two, as we call it, management account. Um, I also highlight, I'm zooming into a site here. Um, if you essentially click on an individual site, then you can kind of see the whole whole suite of metrics, latest metrics, as well as the sampling years for that site. So these all would be the very latest uh, disturbance gradient scores for these metrics, um, including water quality index. Um, you also can view if you have the kind of so-called level two access, you can view a unique list of species that have been observed at the site over all of the monitoring um, surveys that have been conducted in this case. Uh, three different surveys have been conducted, in, including some monitoring that's already gone in for 2022. And here's the late, unique list of species that have been observed at the site. So uh, we find that management folks often like to be able to, to access that information. So we provide it in, in, in this kind of format. Now, some uh, a little bit more advanced um, uh, tool options that are available here. So one thing we've provided is a wetland site comparison tool. So recognizing that um, 
you may want to, or users may want to look across multiple sites in a particular region with respect to these disturbance gradients. We have this, uh, this tool where you can essentially add an extent on the map. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw a box over uh, the Eastern shoreline of Lake Michigan here, select these sites. Uh, when I do that, they're listed in this, uh, uh, this menu here and we can click the uh, compare sites uh, button. Um, now you have the option to select, you know, a limited set or the entire set from the map um, that were shown. Um, and then to basically generate a comparison table, kind of a matrix of the different uh, metrics, as well as some basic information about the site. So here we've got a large number of sites. You can see, you can scroll to the, to the right to see this. And then if you're interested in comparing vegetation IBI, for example, or the water quality index slash sum rank, you'd be able to view that with this, this matrix. Uh, you could also you know, reduce it down to a lower number of sites, lesser number of sites, and update the table accordingly. So that's that's one analysis tool that's that's available there. I'm gonna go ahead and clear that. Um, one other thing I wanted to highlight here is that the fish and invertebrate crews, when they go out, they they often take photo documentation of the site, which can be very you know, inter informative, um, provides a visual of areas that are being sampled as well as uh, fish specimens that have been caught uh, during the, uh, the sampling. Not all this information is daylighted to the public, but there are thousands of photos um, associated with the program that are included along with the rest of the data in the database. And uh, that information, some of that information is daylighted to the public as well. Um, so I just want to highlight that feature. And I'm going to show, kind of wrap up with this. I'm going to show uh, the site kind of reporting capability. Uh, it provides a little bit deeper dive into, into some of the key observations from the site, not necessarily the raw data, but a lot of the information around the raw data. So. Um, I believe this is available at all different user levels, but it, the information that's accessible in this view is, is kind of tiered. So if I click on the report uh, button there, this allows us to basically navigate between different sites. Here I've got the Pentwater River wetland highlighted. Um, you can see it's kind of divided into three different sections, overview and interpretation, field observations, and then monitoring results. Um, Overview and interpretation is intended to be um, a place where users can go and view things like a site interpretive and narrative. Um, we have a placeholder in, in this case for this site. This is very much in progress yet, but the hope is that down the road as, as the program kind of progresses through time, um, different teams will be able to develop these, these narratives, which will provide some context for the site, um, as well as specific summaries for any restoration and manage or management activities of are being conducted at the site or are being planned in the near future. Uh, so we envision that will eventually be a very useful resource right now. It's still kind of in the development phase. The fish and invertebrate crews in particular, when they go out, they collect a number of additional field observations at the site. Again, very useful context. Um, depending on what you're uh, evaluating a, a site for, but you can see that they, they collect things like braiding index and hydrologic connection to the lake. Uh, water level modifications that are observed at the site. Some different characteristics related to habitat type, uh, which vegetation zones were sampled. For example, for this site, uh, typha was sampled in 2021, um, likely being dominant at the site. And then also disturbances. So um, any particular disturbances kind of categorized into things like shoreline modifications, recreation types, pollution, uh, near shore land cover conditions. Um, you can also toggle between uh, prior years. So by default, you see the most recently sampled year. Uh, but in this case, we could toggle back to 2020 and, and potentially look at some of the differences that were observed. So just one very simple example. In 2020 at this site, uh, no other disturbances were recorded or observed. And then in 2021, um, it was noted that invasive frog that was observed at the site. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't present at the prior um, during the prior sampling year, but um, is an example of, of something that was was newly observed and may be of interest. So uh, going to the final pane here, so monitoring results, this provides a lot of the um, 
again, a disturbance gradient scores that we've been talking about the last few minutes here. In this case, you're looking at a particular site and you can look uh, across that, across the different years that monitoring was conduct conducted at that site. So uh, for this particular site, Pantwater River, monitoring has been conducted 2015, 2020, and 2021. And so you potentially can look at the progression of um, some of these indicator scores through time. Don mentioned the um, a lot of caveats around this and, and things constantly changing up these sites, the importance of local um, conditions and how they change through time. Um, so you need to keep all of those in mind when looking at this kind of information. But um, the hope is that some trends can be detected through time for these various sites uh, as the monitoring program pr proceeds through its um, kind of year 10 through 15 here. Um, and just quickly switch over to another site that just illustrates um, a case where you have much more data available just to kind of illustrate this. So here's a here's a site that gets sampled um, generally pretty continuously through time. You can see that. I won't go into the reasons for that, and, and Don and Matt could explain that more. But um, even in this case, we can kind of compare this visually uh, in this matrix. Uh, we could also look at Charts just kind of highlighting unique uh, taxa that have been observed across the different groups for these different years. Most sites don't have data sets this dense, but this one you can kind of look at this through time and, and potentially detect some trends visually. Um, finally, just to wrap up here, you can also look at information on a zone level. So, for example, if you wanted to see what the fish uh, fish and invert crews observed in the sparse bulrush region in 2021, you could make those selections in this tool and be able to see that. Again, not all of these tools are daylighted to the public or even to the management level, but they kind of exemplify some of the information and, and the ways we process and provide it um, within the research team and beyond. Uh, so at this point, I wanna go ahead and hand off to uh, Matt Cooper, who's gonna do a deeper dive into the decision support tool. So I've shown uh, how um, tool can be, or data can be accessed and evaluated to some degree. Matt's gonna talk more about the application of the data for management purposes. All right, I'm here. I'm just switching over my screen here. Bear with me a second. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for uh, for joining us and sticking it out here through the hour. Um, so I'm going to show you another set of tools on the website, and um, we call it the decision support tool. And um, you know everything Todd just showed you. You know that that information you know, is used to make decisions. So it's not like one area is, you know, for making decisions in one area it's not. This is just, um, what I'll show you here is what we've we've, we've called the decision support tool. Um, so I'm back on the main website. Uh, I'm logged in as a, as a user. Um, I'm gonna go to this mapping tools area again. So Todd just showed you things in the site mapping tool. I'm gonna drop down here to decision support tool. Click that. And so this opens a whole new area of the website, um, again, with monitoring data behind it, but some additional uh, functionality. Okay, so the first screen that pops up is an acknowledgement page and a user agreement page. Um, and I'll just note here that, you know, US EPA with Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funds, um, funds the program from, has funded the program uh, since 2011 to collect data. And then other partners have supported the development of some of these tools, including um, you know, Fish and Wildlife Service, Army Corps of Engineers, Michigan Eagle, um, to, to sort of build out our, our functionality with some of, these, uh, some of these tools. All right, so I'll agree to that. And then um, this right here is our main sort of landing page and main page for the decision support tool. Laid out with three panels. Uh, let's say the left panel is uh, essentially those like typical navigation and map overlay functions um, for this. I'll show you those in, uh, in a little more detail in a second. The middle panel is where uh, sort of the work of the decision support tool can get done. And of course the map interface is on the right. Um, so on the left, you've got map navigation, you know, typical stuff, actually similar to what Todd just showed you. You can go to an individual site, you can get back to full extent, that kind of thing. 
there's base map options. I like to leave it in this uh, this ocean coverage map that's on the front there, or that's on the page now. I think that's the easiest to view. Um, and then there's a series of overlays that that we've added. Um, and so if you're working with our data using the decision support tool, um, you know, and you have a site you're looking at, and you want to look at something like land cover. Um, around that site that overlays available and there's a series of other overlays as well so that's all that left panel um, these uh, just kind of kind of overlays and navigation all right so let's move to kind of how this uh, this area this decision support tool is different from what Todd showed you so the uh, sort of the big picture on this DST is that uh, we we sent out a number of surveys back in I think 2015 or 2016 to prospective data users asking sort of you know what would you like to see in a decision support tool and some of the themes that came back was data access like easy data access and then being able to compare sites to each other within a region um, and so much of what Todd just showed you with that matrix view follows that same that same theme and it's uh, it's also in this decision support tool here um, okay, so let's get into this, what's in this middle panel here, these functions. Um, and first of all, the very top drop down there says tutorials and walkthroughs. So we've been with you for 40 minutes now. I know how it gets if your attention um, is waning. Uh, note this tool, this tab right here, because this actually uh, covers everything that, that I'm talking about. So tutorials and walkthroughs includes two videos. One is kind of an overview of the program. Uh, the other is the CWDST tutorial. This is a video that plays, it's 12 minutes, and it walks you through everything in this DST. So that'll be really handy if you're thinking about um, using this particular tool. Go ahead and, and uh, make sure you can access that, that video. Um, there's also some walkthroughs. These are actually like step-by-step -step walkthroughs and how to do a, a scenario using the tool, uh, which can also be handy as you're learning it. Okay, now let's go ahead and move into a, a demonstration here. Um, and so the, the way the decision support tool works is you select an area that you're interested in, a region, geographic region. Those wetlands then you can filter them and look at you know, subsets of wetlands based on certain things that you are interested in and then rank those wetlands based on other things you might be interested in. Okay, so we might select an area, filter by wetlands that include some state land, and then rank those by something like an IBI score. Let me do one of those as a demonstration here. I'm gonna create a new scenario. So I'm a logged in user, so all my previous scenarios are saved, but let's create a new one for today. Um, say Michigan Wetlands Association 22. All right, so now I've started this, uh, this particular analysis, this scenario we call it. Now I need to select my geography of interest. Select wetlands on Saginaw Bay. So I just drag a rectangle on the map there and that um, subsets the uh, all the wetlands to just Saginaw Bay. All right, so this is the set of wetlands I'm going to work with here in this particular analysis. Um, there's some predefined scenarios. We're going to skip that for now. Let's do one of our own. So of these wetlands that are in this geography, I can now select whichever subset or a subset that I'm interested based on any number of this long list of, excuse me, of attributes. You can see it's a big list and um, it's everything from like ownership of that land, um, surrounding land use at various buffer sizes, even you know, population density, uh, then we get into our monitoring data below that, things like uh, Phragmites, uh, invertebrate IBI scores, certain fish species, and, um, and some chemistry attributes from our, our database. All right, so a whole big variety of different attributes. Each one of these variables is associated with each of these sites. All right, so let's say, as our example here, I want to find wetlands that have some state ownership. Maybe I work for the state of Michigan and I'm, I'm sort of focusing on that type of, or those wetlands that have some state ownerships. So I'll say percent state, I'll add that filter. And let's say anything with at least like 1% state ownership is something I'm interested in. Little slider bar there to select that. I'll apply that filter. 
Okay, so what I did is I just found all the wetlands with at least 1.4% state ownership. And you can see on the map, a few of them dropped off, but these are all wetlands with some state ownership. I could stop there and say, all right, this is these are the wetlands I, I'm interested in. I could um, take a look at what those wetlands are, or I could download data associated with those. Okay, so I could just stop right there, but the tool offers another way to look at these sites, and that's by ranking them based on whatever attribute I choose. Okay, so of this subset of wetlands, I could rank them based on that same big list. So the area of the wetland, the owner, the state ownership, land use, whatever. Let's say, um, let's rank them by the, um, the water quality index. So this is based on our monitoring data rank by the water quality index. So I selected that, added it, and a rank from highest to lowest. I applied that rank. And now those wetlands in this region with state ownership are ranked by water quality from highest to lowest based on monitoring data. And so it color coded uh, those wetlands based on that ranking. All right, so this is one fairly simple analysis, right? You saw from that big list of attributes, you could create some really complex and, and unique uh, sort of scenarios um, to analyze these data. But we're gonna, we're gonna stick with this kind of simple one, state ownership and water quality. We can view the results by clicking on this view, view listing. Um, maybe that's all we need. Maybe we just need to see what are the top three. I think what's probably more important, more useful, is the ability to access the data from these sites directly. So the, the um, button down here, export to Excel, allows us, click that, it allows us to download the data from these sites, including the results of this analysis. And so not only the list of sites, but all the attributes that went into that analysis and any others that we're interested in from that big list. So I could say, select all, it will actually uh, assemble all those, all those attributes, both from our monitoring program and then the others that uh, we've assembled along with those. So I select it all, hit download, and it downloads it to a zip file and can open as a, a spreadsheet. All right, so that is sort of the nuts and bolts of the decision support tool, uh, both the mapping interface and the ability to download results of, of an analysis. All right, and again, um, I guess I'll, I'll sort of finish up with a reminder that all this is kind of contained in this tutorial video um, and that list of attributes to do these analyses is is fairly comprehensive. So there's lots of different ways you can look at, or you can build analyses um, to, to sort and rank these particular wetlands. All right, I promised I would leave plenty of time for Q&A and it looks like we, uh, we have just over 10 minutes for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up with that. Okay, thank you all for that excellent presentation. It looks like an immense amount of work went into like both collecting that data and then organizing it into that awesome just decision support tool. Um, that's really useful and really cool just to play around with if, if nothing else. Um, Folks, if you have any questions for our presenters today, please submit them through that Q&A function. I haven't received any yet. So if you, if you have questions, type them up really quick so I can ask them. Uh, in the meantime, I have a question for the presenters. And I, no I noticed, um, Todd, when you were running through those IBI scores that um, some indicator groups switched into a more degraded category within the span of one year. Are, are all of the Great Lakes coastal wetlands degrading at such a rapid rate? Or that seems like a big change in one year. Yeah, I think it might be better for Don to, Don to speak to that, but I think uh, going back to his comments about um, importance of context, what's happening through time at the site and across these different sites, I think is, is really important to keep in mind there. 
Yeah, I think Todd just nailed it. It, it, you know, when when Matt or Todd were clicking through those, and they did shift, it's important to keep in mind what were you looking at. What, you know, was it chemistry? Was it invertebrates and vegetation? So the simple answer is no. They are not all degrading at that rate. But keep in mind, there's an enormous amount of variability, and that's why if you use all of those metrics or indicators in conjunction, you get a much better picture of what is really taking place. Uh, we use these data to report in the Sogol reports. And for the most part, from um, the systems are, are, you know, I wouldn't say grading according to these um, metrics, certainly not across the board. Some are, some are not, some are getting better. Okay. Matt, would you like to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, the only thing that I would reiterate, I, and you said it, is um, is how complex these systems are and how much natural variability there is built in. I mean, that's what makes coastal wetlands special and important is you've got these really dynamic, complex ecosystems. And so us as, you know, those assessing those systems and, you know, folks managing and working with these systems just have to appreciate that every time we work with these data. Um, and so, you know, having a, a whole suite of indicators helps us to interpret what's going on, but it's still, you know, highly complex. You need all these indicators and the data, uh, the raw data behind it to, to attempt to understand what's going on. Thank you. I will, I will just kind of add on to that, that one thing I, I didn't really underscore, but um, hopefully it was, was clear from our presentations that those are very much, the data set is of course a living data set that gets added on to each year. That's also true for the tools. Um, we are updating things at least every spring, and so yeah, there's more information always coming in, and there's always more analysis and assessment to do. So it's it's kind of a it continues to be a work in progress, like like Don and Matt have described. Yeah, and I'll just I'll, I'll add a case in point, and and Don often measures or mentions this when he's presenting, um, but I don't think he did this time. So there is a there's a wetland on Isle Royal um, that is a long way from any direct human impacts. Um, but tends to show up as a very, you know, moderate quality. It's not because that wetland is degraded. I was just up there a couple of weeks ago and I actually swung into that wetland. It's a beautiful spot. It's, um, it's part of that natural variability. The water, the nutrients are very low. It's a very high quality. It exchanges water with Open Lake Superior. Um, and so that's a case in point where, you know, the indicators are not, they're picking up something other than direct human disturbance in that case. Right, but it's a nice case in point of like these wetlands are are unique. There's something different about that system. Uh, it's probably because the productivity is so low because the nutrients are so low uh, that the fish indicator reacts accordingly. Um, so that's a nice case in point when you see that kind of orangish dot on Isle Royal. It's not because there's a, a big human impact at that site. It's because it's just you know part of the complexity of of these systems. Thank you. Um, I got one question from an attendee. Their question is, how is this project related to EPA's National Coastal Wetland Assessment? Are they related? Yes and no. Um, okay. the <laughs> yes and no, meaning that um, EPA has the National uh, Wetland Program. Um, are looking at different components of the ecosystem. Do we keep those combined? So we work very closely with the, the states and the federal government. So um, in many cases, I would say our data don't match. I mean, they're, they're measuring completely different, different things. Thank you. Of of all the indicator groups, is there is there a specific group that is showing uh, the greatest disparity from reference conditions? Any groups in particular you're worried about? Uh, Matt, your turn, or I could jump in. It's up to you. Um, I don't, go ahead. I'm, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I would I would say I mean when you look at the cut and dry vegetation. And the, fret, the spread of Phragmites, for example, I mean, you can see that clear cut, that red's working its way up. 
And, and, and so I would say that's one, the invasive species in particular, the vegetation. I would agree. And new invasives, right? European frog bit is spreading rapidly in certain areas. And um, so yeah, vegetation is definitely the, the most obvious uh, advance, advancing uh, invasive. Uh, one question from an attendee, are there any requirements to become a registered user of the data or is it simply a matter of obtaining a login? Why don't you grab that one, Todd? Sure, so there's, um, I, I'm realizing I kind of skipped over it or glossed over it, but there is a, a kind of a register button on the upper right hand side of the homepage that I highlight at the beginning of my, my, my section of the talk. Um, so you can click on that and you can you can request an account, um, kind of one of those management tiers, what I call level one and two, they're not quite called that on the website, but there are a couple of options there. Um, so that's how to get a, an account and you can also request um, access to the decision support tool that Matt highlighted there. Um, anyone can get to that tool actually without an account, but in terms of like downloading and, and storing information associated with your account, um, it can be helpful to have an account there. So. So those are a couple of things. And then in terms of if you want um, data that goes beyond the uh, the IBI scores of disturbance gradients, um, at that point, then you kind of need to submit a specific request for what data you want. And at that point, you need kind of a more of a formalized letter that needs to go to uh, Don and some others um, to request those data. But that is an option as well if there are particular raw data sets that you're interested in incorporating into your own analysis. Um, going back to the Phragmites here, uh, are there any other declines um, in other biota that is associated with Phragmites taking over in particular? Um, Matt's sitting there quiet, so I'm gonna I'll jump in. Um, so I, remember, in in some cases, everything is connected to some degree. Uh, in some cases, you see that wall of Phragmites, it could actually increase water quality because the, the amount of nutrients and, um, that are being taken up and required for such huge biomass and such dense biomass, that's not making it to the wetter portion. Uh, but for example, birds, birds and frogs may be very, very much impacted by that, that Phragmites in, in um, in general. So you, you have all these connections and that's why we stress the importance of looking at all of them. Look at all of the metrics or indicators of condition at the same time and put together the picture of what the interactions and what's really happening at that ecosystem. Um, it's too easy for, for people to pick and choose the, the right answer, what they think. So I'm gonna go with this one. You know, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna use invertebrates. Um, and that's not uh, the way we do it. And, and, you know, for years, managers have been asking us, just give us one, you know, give us one condition, number or category. And we keep refusing to do that because of the examples that I went through. It may have a really bad habitat due to invasive vegetation, but it may have really high water quality. So do you average those two? If you average those two, you would come out somewhere in between like moderately degraded, yet there's no part of that wetland that fits that, that hits that category potentially. So you really have to, to look at all of them in conjunction. Thank you. And I think this is our final question here. Um, do you see this decision tool being used to identify wetlands as candidates for restoration, or maybe it has been used for this purpose already? Yeah, I'll take that one. So the original like thrust behind the decisions portal and how it's built um, is prioritizing wetlands for activities, whether it's you know preservation or some sort of active active management, uh, et cetera. That's how it's designed. And so, yes, the, the, the answer to that question is yes. And that's that's how some of the utilities are, are sort of built around that question. What we're finding is um, folks that are using it are using it just as much as a, a data access and visualization tool. 
And so I think it just, it fits both of those um, because it's got the map interface and you can, you know, pick and choose which attributes you want to visualize. Um, so yeah, I think both of those functions are, are what it's good for. And, um, and hopefully with more, you know, as we continue to give these presentations, um, you know, more folks think of ways to use it for prioritization and identifying candidate wetlands for either restoration or preservation. Sure. Do, do you know of any of the examples of that happening yet or not? Tonight? It's kind of been in the mix of, uh, you know, a number of, of projects around, um, you know, work around Saginaw Bay, some work on Green Bay. Um, and so, uh, so yes, what, I mean, I don't have an example of somebody doing that analysis and choosing the bright purple wetland as the as the um, the wetland to work on, and the reason for that is because we recognize, you know, restoration work happens over really long periods, right? You, you build these collaborative networks interested in working in a particular region, and, and so there's sort of this long term horizon on selecting um, wetlands to work in, and so our our data and our tools are fitting into that um, that longer term uh, effort by by folks that are working in wetlands. All right, well, we are at one o'clock today. Um, so MWA sends a big thank you to those that attended this webinar and an even bigger thank you to our presenters today. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to come here and speak about Coast Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands. Um, and that tool is really exciting. Um, so uh, we, we thank you and this concludes our webinar presentation. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.